The depiction of mental health and illness within film has always been a rather spotty road to take for most filmmakers. On one hand, it's a topic sitting ripe with mystery and intrigue due to the inherently taboo and uncomfortable nature of it. And on the other hand, you can really screw it up by flimsily throwing out loose themes and supposed solutions that would make anyone want to jump out of a tall tree. Although, I am by no means even close to the Mr. Doctor, Colonel, Master Supreme Overlord status of any psychologist. Heck, I burn myself out halfway through each day only to brick my brain thinking I can just push through it for the rest of said day. But despite being a big dummy dogwater about brain jazz, I still really enjoy a good mental health story done right. A good mental health story done right, akin to a film like Mary and Max. Mary and Max is an animated passion project created by Adam Elliott about two misfits writing back and forth to each other as pen pals. The film marks the first feature-length venture for Elliott with a few stop-motion animated shorts under his belt at this time, including the more rudimentary claymation of uncle, cousin, brother, and even the Academy Award-winning Harvey Crumpet released in 2003. This short in particular really stands out as the perfect example of what makes Elliott's work so unique and impactful. Inclusions of cartoonish and over-the-top claymation, a story that is both heartwarming as well as heart-wrenching, and a fixation on various mental disorders really marks the cornerstones of this director. Mary and Max is his feature-length debut that follows a mission to hone and perfect each and every one of these traits within its hour and 30 minutes of darkly wholesome ecstasy. The film's plot is rather simple, with two outcast misfits living in Australia and New York coming together by developing a friendship as pen pals. Now this specific plot of two characters writing letters back and forth to each other discovering the meaning of friendship could most definitely turn out to be a meaningless shallow pool of vomit. But the way the film is able to emotionally humanize itself along with the gonads it's got to tackle tough subjects with the tastiest of tastefulness certainly makes it worth the price of admission. Did I also mention it's stop motion animated? Being 100% honest, it's kind of hard to make stop motion look bad. Usually the only thing I have to actually complain about in any of these movies is a lazy third act or some type of annoying comic relief side character. <laughs> huh. However, the thing that makes this style of animation really pop in comparison is the amount of creativity pumped into the wackiness of it all. And let me tell ya, the Mary and Max style might be one of the most creative engagements into this medium of animation. This is mainly due to the character designs just being so forcefully stuffed with tangible personality. The two characters are distinguished from one another by using two rather unappealing color palettes, a washed out black and white for Max, and a muddy brown and tan for Mary. And the clash between these two separate elements certainly works to add personality to the film, rather than coming across as a gross misstep. And I mean, just look at this! The sight of each one of these faces was meticulously planned and skillfully crafted with oodles upon oodles of detail pumped into every dimple, wrinkle, and wart. And they all only appear in this one scene to hear the main character fart. I cannot understand how being honest can be improper. This isn't just the case for scenes of flatulence though, because the movie also enjoys to rip a page out of the Family Guy book with tons of cutaway gags and visuals showing what the characters are talking about within the dialogue. The only difference is McFartland didn't make these ones, so they're actually good. Each one of these gags needed to be conjured from the ground up with an assortment of new well-designed characters, a new background, and even some type of new particle effect in some instances, and that's hard to do in stop motion. The ridiculously impressive part is, pretty much every single one of these cutaways were only used for mere moments of this hour and 30 minute runtime. The animators seriously commit to creatively showing off so many charming and hilarious gags where they really didn't have to. 
Not to mention, the actual animation itself is also rather impressive from a personal standpoint. Now, it's definitely no Isle of Dogs where you could quite literally see, taste, and smell every pore on the characters, but it almost comes across as if it has a bit more charm because of the somewhat noticeable jerkiness of the movements. Many character animations are marked with a slight wobbliness that not only mixes perfectly with the cartoonish designs, but also helps to make the film feel a bit more human. But I feel as though the small amount of error showcased in the animation really helps to prop up the theme of imperfection. This idea that nobody, not the main characters of the story, not the animators, not the director, not even the audience member, is perfect in any way, shape, or form. One of the qualities of day-to-day -day life that has always managed to intrigue me is how we all subconsciously perceive one another. No matter what we try to tell ourselves, there's always some type of interpretation we conjure up in our own head of the ones around us and their flaws. Things start to get a little dicey, however, when this interpretation becomes skewed or just flat out wrong in one way or another. The two main characters of the film, Mary and Max, could come across pretty easily as incredibly flawed and broken characters worthy of a poor perception. But the film does a fantastic job at framing these possible blemishes as a necessary part of what makes them Mary and Max. The main highlight of these letters they write back and forth are the bizarre and wholesome ways they are able to relate to each other. Mary is a child that has been severely neglected by a troubled home and school life, while Max is a confused, obese, middle-aged man living with Asperger's in 1970s New York, who is also voiced by Philip Seymour Hoffman, tragically enough. Thankfully, there are some nice and wholesome ways that they are able to relate, such as the generally innocent and straightforward nature and how they perceive the world, but there are also some tragic methods in which they are able to relate, such as the social outcasting they both endure in day-to-day -day life. The two are established without any companion in their personal life to relate their troubles and anguish with, so the bond they form comes across as very natural and fulfilling to watch. However, a truly impressive accolade of the storyline is the impeccable balance of both dour and whimsical tones. The wacky nature of the film is a perfect little glob of glue that keeps the dour moments from being too overbearing, as well as keeping the whimsical moments feeling justified. What would be absolutely sickening is if Mary and Max just kind of clumsily flew through its off-the-walls tone without counteracting it with anything. There is certainly a consistent tone of cartooniness, but what contrasts with it perfectly is the alternating despondence of each and every plot beat. There are some incredibly stunning tonal shifts that I would love for everyone out there to experience for themselves, so please, if you haven't seen the movie, just skip to this part in the video, or honestly just shut it off, because I would hate to ruin it for you. With that said, the radical tectonic shifts in tone come across as very closely structured around the characters and their emotions. Mary starts out as an innocent child curious about the world and its many wonders, but as she seeks to express this curiosity and wonder, it slowly comes to fruition that the world is a bit more spiny than she initially realized. Within her upbringing, she endured constant neglect not only from her dismissive and downright scathing peers, but even from her parents who were dealing with their own internal problems. A constantly tipsy alcoholic mother and an isolating depressed father who rarely interacted with his daughter proved to take quite a toll on Mary. Enough of a toll to make her spontaneous new friendship with Max that much more meaningful to her. She had never had another person in this impudent world to converse with, let alone relate to. And with this, she inevitably dumps all of her emotional baggage onto this fellow misfit. Max, on the other hand, is the type of character that usually does not deal well with new and confusing information. So it only makes sense that tonal shifts linked with him are swift and violent in nature to reenact how quickly his anxiety can act up. When Mary questions Max about dense topics such as bullying, the nature of love, and even the topic of where babies come from in America, Max is forced into violent panic attacks that debilitate him for hours on end, but the way that this is presented in the film is rather telling in how it immediately switches straight back over to the quirky and hilarious letters Max writes to Mary. We go from the struggle of anxiety and connecting to the human condition to nosediving straight into the origin of babies being dependent on your religious affiliation. Unfortunately, in America, babies are not found in cola cans. I asked my mother when I was four, and she said they came from eggs laid by rabbis. 
If you aren't Jewish, they're laid by Catholic nuns. If you're an atheist, they're laid by dirty, lonely prostitutes. So this is where babies come from in America. This manages to hit like a truck compared to the horrendous and heartbreaking reveal of Max's panic attacks, but it also serves as a perfect gateway into his headspace. Having the emotions of the audience member be frazzled, dazzled, torn to shreds, and put back together effectively within mere minutes, it can prove to help us understand the emotional instability of Max very intimately. Unluckily for Mary, she fails to realize that her actions proved to be rather ill towards their friendship near the back end of the film. Up until this point in her life, Mary has had a great deal of downs and ups. She suffered through gaining the title of orphan and losing both of her parents through two rather unfortunate accidents, but she also managed to marry the man of her dreams. However, things start to go drastically south whenever she dedicates her life to the study of Asperger's in an attempt to quote-unquote fix those with the condition. This sends Max into a fury of anger in which he writes to Mary an incredibly scathing letter expressing his betrayal and rejecting her as a friend. Mary is met with an excruciating guilt as she had pushed away the only person in her life that she had felt a connection with. She soon after falls into a deep depression with the overwhelming feeling of worthlessness keeping her from her pet rooster, her childhood neighbor, and even the man she fell in love with who drops all support and leaves her to drown in her own void. It is truly heart-wrenching to see this child brimming with wonder and curiosity slowly morph into a person who despises herself and everything good that can possibly happen to her. This climax then develops into one of the most powerful and impactful scenes that I have ever witnessed in an animated movie. Just a little girl I asked my mother What will I be? Will I be pretty? Will I be rich? Here's what she said to me Que sera, sera All of the emotion packed down and bottled up suddenly escapes out of her in this psychedelic experience brought upon by Valium and Rope. This terrifying imagery followed by an explosion of emotions is made all the more eerie and visceral through the passionately sung music backing this entire scene. The context, the animation, the frightening realism of the whole sequence, all of it perfectly mimics the power that Mary's mental health has in this point in her life flawlessly. This passionately horrifying scene slams you like a truck with no remorse and no reservation, and that is why it is one of my favorite scenes to come out of any animated movie. However, the ending of this film thankfully comes nicely knitted in a warm and comforting bow that whips itself back around to the main message of the entire emotional roller coaster just witnessed. The message warning us to avoid basing our whole perception of a person on their flaws and moments of weakness. Max showcases this through writing one final letter to Mary, forgiving her for the previously taken missteps. He expresses how there are certain potential flaws that actually manage to mold us into the person we are, as well as certain immovable flaws that we must learn to maneuver around rather than fight against. If we spend all of our time ruminating on said flaws in unhealthy ways, then it will only drive our mental stability up the wall and make it ten times worse. Max realized that the hurt caused by Mary was an honest mistake that could be rather easily forgiven despite his shortcoming of anger. Nobody is perfect. Like, the reason why this film resonates with me just so incredibly much as to making it one of my favorite movies, really, is because it takes such a sterile lesson and moral that could be considered to be really cliche, and it actually shines a very deserved light onto it. 
like the idea of self acceptance. The idea of self acceptance and loving yourself is something that has been beaten to death throughout many kids' movies, throughout many just regular movies in general. And I do feel like a lot of films manage to not really convey the visceral nature of something like that. Because I'll be honest, I am certainly someone who manages to struggle with being secure in themselves a lot of the time. That is one of the main reasons why it does take me so incredibly long to create any videos like this. It's because I get caught up in my head and I just think these rampant thoughts of like, oh wow, yeah, this freaking sucks, dude. Like, there's nothing that is good about this video that you were making. Why are you even creating it? There's this that's wrong with it. There's that that's wrong with it. The You're not really saying anything. Uh, this part doesn't really flow all that well. You're not putting in enough interesting graphics or you're not putting in the right pieces of information or footage from the movie in specific scenarios. And it just builds and builds and builds until I just get so overwhelmed by it that I, I just just feel like I don't even want to touch a editing software. But thank but thank goodness there are people like Adam Elliott out there that are really trying to communicate this idea in a humanistic and genuine way. This this is the type of movie that ensures to the viewer that no matter how badly you want to close yourself off from those around you or even close yourself off from what you are passionate about, no matter how terrible or irredeemable of a peer person you think you might be, no matter how badly you want to just drop it all and give up, you should always fight off the raging hopelessness that constantly attempts to sink its teeth into you. And that right there is is honest to God why I would call Mary and Max a 6 out of 10. <laughs>